transportation resolutions to here this afternoon, I would like to ask each of the authors of the bills, the sponsors, to try to limit their presentation to no more than 10 minutes, and hopefully that would include questions also. So that being said, I'm going to start off with H.R. 48, Representative Evans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'll try to start us off with a good example and go much less than 10 minutes, but part of that's up to y'all with your questions. Um, these resolutions are related, um, but I will speak first on House Resolution 48, if that's okay with um, the chairman, which is a compensation resolution for Mario Stinchcomb. Uh, House Resolution 49 regards Michael Woolfolk. They were co-defendants involved in the same incident. Um, what happened was Michael Stinchcomb, who's the subject of House Resolution 48, was the first person exonerated by the Fulton Conviction Integrity Unit. Uh, so this was a, a very big deal. This was looked at by a lot of folks that ultimately led to um, him getting his motion for a new trial granted, which ultimately led to a no prost or a no prosecution because the evidence was simply not there to, um, to support a conviction. He has been completely exonerated. He was at a home with Mr. Woolfolk when the decedent arrived. And what happened was the decedent was in a car and shot at the home where Mr. Stinchcomb and Mr. Woolfolk were. They then got their weapons to shoot at the decedent in self-defense because she was shooting into the home, including into the windows. There was nowhere for them to retreat and be safe. They were defending themselves. Um, and then one of the bullets from Mr. Woolfolk's gun ultimately hit the decedent and she died. Um, they, Mr. Stinchcomb and Mr. Woolfolk from the very beginning maintained that they acted in self-defense. The physical evidence always supported their testimony that they were acting in self-defense. There was a critical witness who was in the car with the decedent, the woman who was ultimately shot and died, um, who was believed to be dead for some time and did not testify at the trial, even though he had the best viewpoint of what happened and how the driver of the car was shooting bullets toward these gentlemen. Um, but he did not testify in the trial, again, was believed to be dead. Ultimately, the um, the incarcerated individuals found out that he was alive and they were able to obtain his testimony and that's ultimately what led to the exoneration. So again, um, complete exoneration. These gentlemen um, spent 18 years in prison. Mr. Stinchcomb missed seeing his two children grow up, um, had several family members died. Both gentlemen are now um, driving semi-trucks and are both spending time speaking to youth about the importance of making good decisions and. Um, trying to trying to live a good life and um, we've put compensation proposal in these resolutions in line with what the house has done before um, would ask for your favorable consideration we'll stand for any questions are there any questions chairman Mitchell thank you thank you mr. chairman I, I will tell you this um, I, I believe that the applicants or the legislative proposals are good proposals, uh, but I, I think this whole process is a flawed one, Mr. Mr. Chair. I believe that we have turned these compensation resolutions into political process. I believe Georgia should join the majority of states. Will we fix an amount that if you have been wrongly convicted, and let the courts decide who has been wrongly convicted and they are compensated. We've turned this into which legislator is in the right party or who can bring forth uh, the support to do this. And we uh, have those who have been wrongly convicted, their lives are in uh, the balance here. Uh, I think that we should certainly consider a process where we take the politics out of it. If you're innocent, you, you've been found innocent, you get X uh, okay. and, and not go through this every time someone we find is wrongly uh, convicted. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving me an opportunity to voice. Was that, was that a question? 
Yes. Say, isn't it true? No, thank you. I, 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 I don't say that. I, I can't say that I don't agree with you. Uh, I think we took measures to do that actually last year. I think it was last year. Somebody may correct me, but um, I don't know if there's anything in the works for it for this year, but I think it possibly, as so many of our bills do, that we perfect, they, they move somewhere else and they don't go anywhere. So I, I, I don't disagree with your comments. So, Chairman Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a question. It, it appears to me that this was something that happened in the city of Atlanta or Fulton County. Do they make any arrangements to compensate these, or does it fall to the state? I, w I would think where the error happened was in the county and the way that it was prosecuted. Uh, thank you for the question. The, any of these convictions, um, or most of the convictions for any felony are going to occur at whether it's Fulton County or some other county, but district attorneys that make the decisions and the, the convictions that ultimately happen in our court system, those are, um, I believe the reason is that they're constitutional state officers. Um, and so it ultimately falls to the state and not to the county. I don't know if there's, I don't know if any county does anything, but, but the, um, the buck stops here. Mm -hmm. Chairman Workheiser, is that you? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Chairman Sykes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Was uh, could you note any uh, if there are any prosecutorial misconducts that were found in the case? None that I'm aware of. Though, when I look at this, I see that the both defendants constantly from the very beginning, story straight, never changed, never changed, never changed, self-defense. Physical evidence always supported that. There was a, there was an eyewitness who was not in a good position to see what happened, who was sort of in the back of the house running around. His story changed many times, but that ended up being the main basis of what the DA came forward. I mean, that became the, the main source of evidence against these gentlemen. So I wouldn't classify it as misconduct, but if, if I was the DA, I think I would have listened to someone else. Mm -hmm. Representative Gullick. Thank you. I think my question is along the same line. So there was, there was no misconduct on the, on the district attorney's side, in, intentional, or no misconduct on the police side from the investigation standpoint. These people just didn't have a witness that came, a witness just came forward later that exonerated them. Is that, is that the gist? I mean, that's the gist, right? Like, well, there's that, a witness that wasn't there that, that came forward that exonerated them, but the... No one did anything, like, they didn't hide evidence from the defense or, is that right? I don't want to speak on things that I'm not intimately familiar with. I can tell you that this eyewitness was never dead, but the defendants were led to believe he was dead. How they were led to believe he was dead, I couldn't tell you, and I don't want to say things that I don't know for sure are true, but the, but, the, but the bottom line is this witness was available, had exonerating testimony that supported the testimony that was always the same from both the, the defendants, and that's what ultimately led the Fulton Conviction Integrity Unit and the Supreme Court to say that these gentlemen deserved a new trial and then ultimately an exoneration. Okay, and one more question, Mr. Chairman. The, the amounts are different. Can you tell me why the amounts are different? Were they, were they in, in prison longer? Uh, one was been in prison longer, or just what's the reason for the difference? The reason that, that the um, the reason that the amounts are different is that Mr. and Mr. Stinchcomb's amount is different. He's the subject of House Resolution 48. His are different than Mr. Woolfolk's in Resolution 49 because he should not he should not the DA's had a charge for him for illegal possession of a firearm. Now it's important to note, even if you are not legally able to carry a gun, there's nothing that keeps you from being able to use self-defense as a defense. So he, he was still within his rights to defend himself, but he shouldn't have had possession of a firearm. And in recognition of that, uh, we took five years off the amount of compensation for him in, in light of the fact that he shouldn't have had the gun. He was not ultimately convicted of that, of wrongful possession, but, but it was a charge that the DA was ready to bring. Chairman Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so my, over here, sorry. My question is also related to the money. How, uh, how, did, how, did you, how were these amounts arrived at? Is there a calculation, <clears throat> particular calculation for these? 
there's a, a calculation that's been used over the years in these compensation resolutions per year, and that's how the amount was arrived at. It's nothing, uh, it's, it's, it follows the formula, for lack of a better word, that we've tried to use over the years. So, so would it be fair to say that these amounts are consistent with other amounts paid throughout over the years? Yes. Chairman Yerda. Thank you. Uh, did the Compensation Review Board make a recommendation on this case? Uh, the Compensation res Resolution, the Compensation Board did um, hear these cases, and as seems to be the typical answer, it was their answer was no, though they acknowledged the exoneration, acknowledged the problems um, in the cases, their decision to say no, as it always is as far as I know, was based simply on the fact that they are trying to decide whether the state agency, the um, corrections department, did something wrong. And the corrections department, of course, did nothing wrong. And so that might be one way, Mr. Chairman, um, expanding the, the jurisdiction of what the Compensation Review Board can base their decisions on might keep these out of our hands. Thank you. Chairman Mitchell. Yeah. Very quickly, Mr. Chairman. Just to, to, for a point of clarity, they were cleared not by some nebulous authority. They were cleared by the ultimate legal authority in this state, the Georgia Supreme Court. Am I correct? The Georgia Supreme Court granted their motion for a new trial, and when they went back for the new trial, it was apparent to the DA that there was no evidence. There was a null process, and there was, an, there was an exoneration by the Fulton Conviction Integrity Unit. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Parsons. Thank you, Chairman. I wanted to ask the lady, uh, am I correct that when, uh, on both of these, the uh, conviction was vacated, I guess is what you call it, and the, they were no prost, I think that's the term. So does that not, does that not mean that the, uh, the state of Georgia has said that they, um, they were, that conviction was vacated, that they, it, it, in fact, did not commit those crimes. They, 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 the, the conviction doesn't stand. I mean, I don't know what, what the right terminology is, but in the eyes of the state of Georgia, once, they, once it, those convictions were vacated and there were no prost, they didn't happen. And they, they were, in fact, in prison for a period of time when they shouldn't have been in prison. Isn't that kind of like a bottom line? I mean, that to me it is anyway. Yes, that's correct. And unfortunately, there's no provision in our, um, in our judicial system where you're ever found innocent. You know, you're found not guilty um, or you're null prost and you're exonerated. And that's, an exonerated means we can't say that you did anything. And, and you're, for lack of a better word, you're not guilty. <laughs> There have been many lights illuminated, and the last one is Dean Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. After looking at the uh, House resolution and listening today, I would like to be recognized for a motion. Uh, that is appropriate at this time. I would like to move due pass for House Resolution 48. We have a motion and we have a second. Is there any further discussion? Any further questions? All right, then we'll vote and I will say let's vote by a show of hands, please. All those in favor of the motion to do pass, raise your hand. Yeah, let's go. opposed motion carries all right next next resolution is house resolution 49 and representative evans you can it's all yours okay. thank you mr chairman house resolution uh, 49 um, is regarding michael wolfolk who was the other defendant that i discussed in the previous presentation um, 
same situation. The only difference, of course, is the difference in compensation for the reasons that we discussed. Um, and also, I'll share in candor with the committee, it was Mr. Woolfolk's bullet that ultimately uh, did strike the defendant. But again, all in self-defense, um, all exonerated. And I'll stand for additional questions, but again, it was the same, same incident. Any questions on HR 49? Chairman Knight. And again, it, more clarification with the self-defense, uh, and I apologize if I didn't get more of what happened in the first resolution as I came in a, a few minutes late. But could you go back over about the, the self-defense here and, and what happened and how they came to the conclusion that it was self-defense? later on sure the decedent was um, shooting toward a home where mr. Wolfolk and mr. Stinchcomb were uh, shooting at them into the home um, they ducked to get their firearms and she was continuing to shoot into the window there was nowhere for them to retreat so they were shooting back in self-defense and, and that's how that happened um, they had maintained from the beginning that it was self-defense the physical evidence always supported the theory that it was self-defense there was one eyewitness who had a, had an alternate version of events um, but ha that person had changed their stories multiple times the person with the best bird's eye view so to speak was the person who was in the decedent's car uh, when shots were being exchanged um, he had an unencumbered view he was believed uh, for many years to be dead um, and so his testimony was never part of the original trial. It was learned um, by the defendants while they were incarcerated that this person was alive. They were able to get um, his testimony, and that's what ultimately led to the exoneration. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chairman Warkheiser. Thank you, Chairman. At the appropriate time, I'd like to make a motion. Are there any further questions? I don't see any. Is I move to pass. We have a motion to pass on HR 49, LC 44, 2185. Is there a second? All those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, any opposed? Motion carries. HR 49 has passed. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Evans. Our next resolution is HR 55, and it's LC number 2336S. Representative Buckner. And if you will, the same. I will. Brevity, if at all possible, but make sure you cover what you want to cover. Yes, sir, I will. Um, first of all, I, I thought you might be interested in knowing that House Bill 364 is a bill to establish a wrongful conviction commission. So um, that is out there if, if we have the um, time and appetite to take it up. Um, I'm here this afternoon and I'm nervous. Y'all, this is a, a, a task that if you, as a state representative you may not want to have to do for your constituents because of the fact that so much rides on this for the individual. Um, I was redistricted into a brand new area last year and when I ran I had the opportunity to meet the law enforcement in the new part of the district in LaGrange, Georgia where this um, all happened a number of years ago, 42 years ago in, in, um, to be exact. Uh, the um, events that occurred resulted in my new constituent being wrongfully convicted and ultimately imprisoned for the better part of his life, his most productive years of his life. And evidence was found by a joint reinvestigation by the LaGrange Police Department, the Coweta Judicial Circuit, and the District Attorney's Office, and the Georgia Innocence Project to prove that Mr. Terry Talley was innocent of the crimes he was convicted of, which was rape. Um, 
what we know is that um, Terry Talley's conviction was based on unreliable evidence, missing, there was evidence that was missing, um, the LaGrange Police Department failed to investigate a viable alternative suspect that they were aware of at the time. Almost all of the biological and physical evidence from the original investigation had been lost or destroyed. And um, most importantly, when they did find that some biological evidence that had not been destroyed, it proved that he was not the person who committed the rape. Um, I'm not, the, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure what some of you that are lawyers would want to know, but I made it a point before I took on this task to go and meet the people involved that I could find to meet. And I met Mr. Talley, and in his own words, uh, he is a simple man. He has limited education. Uh, he, he did odd jobs around town and um, dropped out of uh, before high school and was just a day worker that picked up odd jobs in the neighborhoods in LaGrange. And when all of these crimes occurred, they thought that the MO was the same for everyone and they thought that they were looking for a serial rapist and um, they were looking for anyone that they could find in the community that um, uh, might, might um, have been around the area where they occurred. He was exonerated. And what I've learned through this process is that the legal system demonstrated his innocence by exonerating him, and that is no easy process to go through. He was found to be not guilty, and he has been released from jail. He was exonerated for 25 years, nine and point seven months that he served and we're seeking compensation for that time that he served based on the usual and customary chart that's been used for other type cases. Um, we've, we as a house have passed uh, numerous measures to ensure that our DNA evidence is collected and that it is used and this is to uh, identify people who commit sexual assaults but it has another purpose, it can get people that um, uh, have uh, been falsely and wrongly incarcerated freed and that's what it has done in this case. That DNA has led to his exoneration and I would appreciate your favorable consideration for this compensation. Thank you. Any questions? Hit your, hit your button. Chairman Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it, this question goes more not to the presenter except for clarification. When it was reinvestigated, was it determined that someone early on withheld or took actions in the local law enforcement that led to this situation. In other words, my concern as a legislator is that if someone is a bad actor in public safety and it comes to the state to solve it, we're not getting to the real problem, which is we are essentially providing cover to somebody's incompetence at the local level. And um, my concern is that this process we're using now provides a path for areas in our state where errors are occurred and are protected because they know it gets tossed to us and the one who was a bad actor never has to pay for a cost to the state and to the victim. Is it not true? <laughs> I, I can't address, because I wasn't there, and I can't address the people in charge then, but the police chief that, that um, I dealt with that asked me to work on this did feel a, a heavy weight of this not being handled appropriately, and he, it prompted him to draft and secure passage of post-conviction standards that are now certified for police departments all across Georgia, and they have been officially adopted, and so um, that 
I guess you might say is a little bit of good that came out of it, but it was a different person. Representative Gallup. Yeah, same question. I, I think similarly. So she, she asked about the, the police, but there, so the chief didn't believe some, believe something wasn't done appropriately, but wasn't sure what. I guess is what you're what you're, you know wasn't there, sure what, or it wasn't handled properly in his eyes, and he still allowed it to happen. Why was there the reinvestigation? Well, no. So I mean, like at the time, did it, did the state? Did, the, did the, either the police department or the, the district attorney at the time, did anyone withhold information or was it just that the DNA wasn't there? We didn't have the technology at the time to, to exonerate this person. And as technology improved and we have DNA, um, that they're exonerated now? It, it was, was, did anyone do anything wrong? Like, was a wrong, was a but misconduct happened during the, during the case to, you know, that was withheld? There, the, there was information withheld from, um, the, the, the law enforcement officials to Mr. Talley's legal defense. There was um, evidence um, like a, a glove that um, was at the scene of the crime that disappeared from the evidence. Um, there was, um, uh, I, don't know, I don't know enough about this of what to call it, but it's the process you use when you identify witnesses. That was not done correctly, and the, one of the people that identified Mr. Talley saying he was the one that did it was actually over the legal limit for um, being intoxicated and there were and in fact one of the people uh, said that he was not the person but when he got in court changed she she changed her mind or or went along with what the um legal person whoever was interviewing her at that time in the courtroom changed her mind about who it was someone did not even see him said that um they thought it was him by s his voice and but a jury still convicted him. The trial lasted one day for okay. one case, and the next day they did the next trial, and they convicted him. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and they we, used the same jury for both trials. We've got three more lights lit up. Dean Green. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For many years, I have served on the Appropriations Committee, and... Is it not true that I served as the chair of the compensation resolutions many years ago? And when you look at these cases, case by case, you begin to understand what has been taken away from the individual. And I, for one, who look at these cases, know for a fact that whatever we give them, will not compensate them. And so, Mr. Chairman, I would like to, at the appropriate time, uh, ask for you to, uh, to give me the opportunity to uh, ask for a passage of this substitute. Okay, Dean Green, I will at the appropriate time. Um, Chair Representative Gamble. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Representative Buckner, what was the recommendation of the Compensation Review Board? The Compensation Review Board's um, vote is typically in the negative for the agency, and so it, I, I don't know how to say this correctly, but they, they said no because it was, they, they took the Department of um, Pardon and Paroles out. Corrections. I'm sorry, and um, that and that makes sense because he was our. That's not. I mean, they just housed him after it had all been done, so they they removed corrections from the blame. Does that make sense? You're looking wrinkled. Well, Representative Buckner, it looks like you have exhausted all of the questions. If I might just say, I, I appreciate, I did meet him. He is working for the Humane Society in LaGrange and is trying to make a life for himself. And I, I'd appreciate your favorable consideration. Dean Green, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I move that we uh, do fast by substitute House Resolution 55. We have a motion 
to do pass on LC 442336S. Is there a second? There is a second. All those in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? The motion carries. Passage of LC 442336S, HR 55. Thank you, Representative Buckner. Um, next is House Resolution or House Bill? House Resolution 70, it's LC 442337S. Representative Williams, do you have a question or is your button, your hat hitting the button? Thank you, Chairman. I, I, I want to very quickly say this, that this is difficult several years, many years ago. A gentleman and his wife were killed. Are you talking about this, this particular I, bill? I, I wanted to, it, it ties directly into what okay. we're doing right. here. A, a gentleman was killed in Camden County, Representative Zane's district. And the gentleman that was killed was an African-American. He and his wife were killed out front. And a white guy did it. So they said. Racial tensions were very high. So he was sent to jail and stayed in jail an awfully long time. I don't know what happened. I don't know if he even got compensation. But I certainly hope that you, sir, as chairman and others, would push for this bill so that we will sit and not have to sit through these. And you're talking about 55 or 70? Yes. 55? Okay. 55. Thank you. I've got to ask, do y'all have questions? You're hitting buttons or are we moving on? I'd like to move the next bill. Okay, we'll get it to you. Chairman Taylor? It, it has to do with the next bill. Okay, can we present it? We're gonna present it first, okay? Is that all right? It says a HB instead of HR. I, I know that. <coughs> it's, it says HB instead of HR, but the LC number will go by, right? It, it's, it's a, we're going to take that as a Scribner's error. Right. The LC number will go by the LC number. Right. It does on your paper, it does say HB 70, but it is HR 70. Um, and we're going to go LC 442337. Um, Chairman Houston is in education where I hope I can go shortly. Um, so we're going to ask the subcommittee chairman Chairman Weedauer, if he'll present this bill for her. Chairman Weedauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will do my best with this and her absence, um, but this is this is dealing with, I, I believe, Mr. Inman. Um, bottom line, uh, in Adele, Georgia, at a Taco Bell, a manager was shot and killed. Uh, her, her car was uh, stolen and abandoned nearby. There is absolutely no physical evidence that uh, Mr. Emmon was ever uh, connected to this whatsoever. This does involve uh, the, the GBI uh, and falsely, a uh, inv lead investigator for the GBI falsely testified that he had not received any information. Um, however, he had received information that Hercules Brown was actually the perpetrator that committed the, tr the crime. Um, Inevitably, Mr. Emmon was convicted. Um, later on, uh, they, there was actually a, a makeshift hood that was used by uh, Hercules Brown that was later tested for DNA that connected Hercules Brown to the crime itself. Um, again, this is, and I hate to, uh, to pontificate here, but this is, um, pretty cut and dry that the, there was lots of evidence that was withheld 
um, in his conviction. And uh, many years later, uh, other things surfaced to exonerate him. Great job. 31, who is, uh, who's asking a question over here? I can't, Chairman Yerda. Right here, uh, Chairman Weedower, did the Compensation Review Board make a recommendation on this case? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. I should have uh, included that. Um, this is actually a very uh, unique situation where they actually unanimously approved this. Four to zero. They they unanimously approved this four to zero, which is which is unique in these compensation resolutions. Representative Gerda, I mean, Gullet. Goodness. Well, you're Gullet and Yerda. I'm mean, sorry, I got y'all confused. Um, <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So there was miscon. There was. Evidence withheld. The state m did misconduct against this very clear individual. Thank you very much. Chairman. Chairman Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the proper time, I'd like to make a motion. It's that time. I move that we approve this request. Motion is to approve LC 442337. Motion is due pass. Is there a second? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. I think that's unanimous. That's, that's unanimous. Cool. Any opposed? Any opposed? <laughs> motion carries. Thank you for your attendance. It is very overwhelming that so many of you are here and we will see you Monday.